I'm Dick Gordon. This is the story. One of the real pleasures of this job is the chance to touch the hands of people who themselves have held the hands of history. I recently sat down with Barbara Liederman Rod Bell at her home here in Chapel Hill. Barbara survived the Holocaust. The way she did that, the wit and the intelligence she displayed as a teenager in wartime Holland, well, that's a story all on its own, and we'll get to that in just a moment. When Barbara and her sister and parents fled Germany, she was eight. They moved to a neighborhood in Amsterdam, close to another family of Jews who'd fled Germany. Barbara made friends with one of them, Margot Frank, and Margot's little sister was Anne Frank. And what happened was, of course, that we, since we lived in the same neighborhood, we went to the same schools. Now, Anne was too young. She was only four or something. I had, and But Margaret and I... Margaret was Anne's older sister, right? Margaret was the older sister. Okay. And she and I ended up in the same school because we were in the same district. Right. And um, the Jaeger School. And... We walked together, and, and we walked back together, and Margaret told I think her parents about our Sunday concerts at home, chamber music. My father, my parents played chamber music and had friends come. Right. So uh, that's how we got together. We invited the Franks for chamber music Sunday. So that's how they became friends. And... I mean, if you look at our pictures, uh, you'll see that their birthday is the usual things, like in America. I mean, you you have parties with your neighbors, and you have right. parties with, you know. It's exactly like it. I mean, we but play it, together, we bake cakes for each other's birthdays. I mean, my parents right. did, and my, father, my mother did. And, of course, Edith Frank, you know, the mother, uh, Frank, Edith, she had a hard time adjusting, and my mother was gung-ho because she was so happy that finally she could get her hand on her children, her hands on her children, because in Germany, you know, there was a nurse, and there was a governess, and then there was a cook, and there was a this and a that, and my mother, she... She did social work. You right. know, that's what one dad did. And, and, you know, and, Do you know what's interesting to me, Barbara, is that as you describe these years with the Frank family nearby, um, you talk about them as a happy time. And, and, and we have this impression that everybody lived under this cloud of uh, the Third Reich building just next door, but, but not, not for you at that time, I guess. Well, from 33 to 40... <laughs> It was okay, you know. I mean, it, was, it wasn't... It was okay. When the Germans invaded Holland, Barbara was a young teenager. And as I mentioned earlier, her friend in the Frank family was the elder sister, Margot. Now, if you know girls of that age, you'll know that they're very busy growing up. They often have very little time for little sisters and their friends. But Barbara remembers distinctly she had a connection with Anne Frank. Yeah, that's the funny thing, because we did. It wasn't that I went to look for her to play, but she came. Because this was Anne, you know. She was uh, enormously bright. and even, You knew that even then? Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, by now, she's older. She's not four years yeah, old. Sure, seven, uh, let's right, say so she'd be nine, ten years eight, old. Eight, yes, and, and, and she was... She was looking for me. She wanted to see, what do you read? You know, she wanted to know what I read. And what's in your father's bookcase? Now, I, we had right behind us when we were playing, we had my father's huge, it was a wall full of books. These are all legal texts, and aren't he, they? No, no legal things. No, his office was somewhere else. Ah, okay. <laughs> no, this was his reading. And um, she was curious what other people were reading and and she what what are, you, what are you playing what are you thinking of and was always looking she was as bright as you could be so would you read together with her she wanted to see you know what does it say on that page she was looking she was difficult she was oh poor mrs frank i you're, tell you you're saying she was a bit of a pest she was diff no not a pest she was just she kept you on your toes, and and um, you can't imagine how bright she was. 
and 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 impatient. She, I mean, she was bored with the little kids. You know, she liked Susanna, but my sister actually didn't like her that much because she said Anna never wants to play a game from beginning to end because she gets impatient in the middle. And the heck with it, you know. <laughs> so so uh, she, my sister, was more calm and and liked. So I, um, Anne, and I would do sort of gymnastics in the one little open space that was there and and move around. I was then going to ballet school. And oh, you were already dancing? I was yeah. trying, yes, yeah. I was starting. Starting, and so, uh, well, that's Anne. I mean, she was, she was, she was interested in us, you know. Do you have any recollection, Barbara, of her doing any of her own writing, starting a diary or anything like that? No. She didn't. I don't. If if she would do that, she would do that at home. Right. But now we're in my house. So she didn't ask you for advice on writing or anything. No, no. She uh, now Margot. You see, she would have asked if you want to know about writing. I mean, she tries to ask Margot because Margot really was very bright, but very very quiet. And and yeah, Margot did have friends later, you know, but she was just so very quiet and thoughtful and. Do you remember, Barbara, the last time you saw the Frank family? Now, you know, I don't know exactly. What happened was that after one year of riding to the Lyceum, the girls' Lyceum, uh, on the bike, uh, first of all, we couldn't ride anymore, and I started going to a different school. And so uh, Margot um, and I didn't see each other. That last year, we practically didn't see each other. You were going off to a dance school? Like no, that. no. Uh, well, I did, actually. Yeah. yeah, but after going to a, a different high school, uh, I went when we couldn't go to public school anymore. No Jews were allowed at public school. No. Right? So, so Margaret did go, the, the Jewish community set up Jewish schools, and uh, Margaret went to one of those, and I refused. So I got my father, with great difficulty, to, to let me go to a ballet school. The last time that Barbara saw anyone in the Frank family was just before that family went into hiding without telling anyone. At 16, young people were told to go to a train at a certain day and that they would be sent to Germany. And the Germans were saying, this, these are labor camps. And I remember a party where people, young people, got together because they were going to be sent away the next day or a couple of days after. And uh, they were saying, oh, it'll be all right, you know, we'll, we'll work hard, we'll have to work hard, but we're going to take some lipstick and a little bit of, you know, some different kind of shoes and, and uh, some whatever to curl my hair to look nice, and we'll sit around camp. They thought it was like a campfire sort of thing, that they would, uh, you know, have a good time. And uh, by that time, I had a boyfriend. And the boyfriend was a little older, and he told me what he knew, which was that it was all going to be killed. He knew that none of these kids would ever come back, that they would all be killed. And of course, these kids didn't believe that. They wouldn't believe me. They wouldn't believe him. But Manfred had met people who had escaped from camps in Germany, boys, men, young men. And he said, uh, there's no question that those camps in the end will kill you. So he says, you are, to me, he said, you are not going. And, and so my father said, yes, you're going if if you get called up and Manfred she, she's not going she's going underground my father didn't like Manfred not at all but Manfred ended up saving my life gosh so you were 16 years old when you left the family 17 I was 17 but but what happened was that uh, so we had some protection but uh, you asked about Margot and yeah. and Margot was was uh, 
when the, when this little note came to Margaret, I didn't even get it because I had to protect you know it. I'm saying you have to go to the camps? Yes, yeah. you have to come to a train station at a certain hour, and they did say, bring a bag with this and that, you know, to, yeah, and a good pair of shoes and a warm, warm jacket or something like that. Uh, um... Margaret, Margaret's father packed up and they left. That's when they went underground. He went, he, he had protected, you know, I, I didn't know any of that. I so must they, tell you. As far as you're concerned, they just disappeared. They disappeared. And you didn't know where they were? No, I did not know. And it was good because I was a blabbermouth. So it was very good that I did not know. What happened was that I one day I went over. We weren't underground yet. So, I mean, I wasn't hidden yet. I was 16 still. And I went over to Margaret's uh, house and, said, uh, and rang the bell. And... Uh, uh, a man opened the door, whom I did, had seen but didn't know, and he said, oh, no, the Franks, he says, uh, they're gone, you know. I think they went to to, uh, um, to Basel, they, to Switzerland. They did have family there, mm -hmm. I knew. So it sounded right to me. I thought they were in I came home, I remember, and I told my mother and father, I said, it's really wonderful, the Franks, the Franks managed to get out to Switzerland. So all the war, I was really very close to them. I stayed very close to them. But all, I never hiding. know. You were in hiding, and neither of you knew no. you, that you were there. No. And so all those months that Anne Frank was writing in her diary, hidden in the secret annex, and the two years before her family was taken away to the death camps, she was actually close to where Barbara was also taking refuge. In just a moment, we'll hear how Barbara, Leader, and Rod Bell survived the war. I'm Dick Gordon from APM, American Public Media. This is the story. I'm Dick Gordon. This is the story. I'm talking this hour with Barbara Rod Bell about her childhood encounter with Anne Frank and Barbara's own story of surviving the 40s in Amsterdam, a time when the Nazis were relentlessly shipping Jews and others to concentration camps. When Barbara was 17, her boyfriend, Manfred, was able to secure false identification papers for her. It was difficult in the beginning to get good papers. It was actually practically impossible. Later on, artists and other people got together and started fabricating or changing uh, original uh, IDs. Uh, you know, the ID had a photograph on it and it had a thumbprint and a signature. And of course, there were certain things they couldn't change if uh, if they want. So, it, like, but they could, you know, when they took out the thumbprint and the picture. They, no, wait a minute. They couldn't take out the thumbprint, but they could take out the picture. Right. So they put my picture in place of Sylvia's. I got the ID of a girl named Sylvia who had died. She, she was so so. I don't know where they got it. But somebody got it, and I, I got it. And um, they took out the picture, put my picture in, and across that was a, 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 a an official stamp. An official stamp, and they could half of it was on the picture, so they had to draw it. Half of it was on the paper, and they left that, and then they drew the rest of the. I mean, they did it very well. I, mean, I have no idea how they did it, but they they did that, and that's what I had. But there was something else on this ID, and that was her birthday, and her birthday was 27. 
and I was I forget what I was at the time maybe 17 or 16 oh she was 27 years old yes that said she, she was, was 27. 27 she was 27 and they couldn't change it because you couldn't get the ink right, right. you know and, so. and you're such a young looking person at that time you probably didn't even look 17 no I didn't at all like 17 and if somebody really wanted to look at it carefully it, it wouldn't have passed but it passed and that if you want to know when it passed, was the day I left home. Tell me about that day. Well, what had happened was that there was a big, what was called a razzia or a pogrom. Rounding up of the Jews. Uh, right? round, yeah, it, it, and it was in our, it wasn't big, it was it was actually by name that time. You know, there were various kinds of pickups. There was pickups where they picked up everybody, then there was pickups where they picked people up by name, and right. etc. So we were sitting at our big window in the front, looking out on the street. But I thought you left, nice. left home at this point. No, I hadn't. Okay. okay. And, um, and, we saw them coming, you know. They came to this house, and they came to that house, and they stopped a f couple of steps before ours. And uh, I had, uh, I had told uh, Manfred knew. Um, he always knew when things were happening, and he knew about this particular pickup. And he sent somebody on a with a German. He, <laughs> the guy had a. German coat on leather and big boots, you know, and whatever else they wear. And, and he came on a motorcycle, big mo motorcycle. And he imagined in the middle of this pickup business, the bell rings. And my father goes out of his mind. They thought he was going to get picked up. So the bell rings, and, and uh, we had to open the door. So we opened the door. And it was this guy, and he came, I'm come for Barbara, he's, he, for me, he came for me to pick me up. And uh, he, had, he said, Manfred sent me to pick you up, so hurry up and get out, we have to get out of here. And my father threw him down the stairs. And he said, uh, he's, the guy later on told me, he said, I said to myself, I'm not going to fight this man. And, and, uh, and he picked up and left. So I got left with my parents. Uh, you know, waiting for what was happening, and somehow it just stopped in front. It didn't come to us. So then Manfred, after that occurrence, said, now you have to go underground. We had been waiting for me to go underground, and I told my parents that I was leaving. And my father said, no, no, no. And I said, well, I'm going. And my mother said, let her go. So I, by that time, I had the false paper, right that I described to you and um, I just took a few little things and I left and they had found a place for me to stay it was a kind of a pension what they called a pension a pension like a rooming house or? a yeah, boarding house yeah. that's what it was a boarding house and the lady didn't know who I was and uh, she gave me a room and she cooked, we ate there and everything. And during the day, I was at the time in, in uh, I, I was in school. I took uh, ballet in the theater, big theater. So anyway, she had no idea who I was and she was good to me like, and everybody else. So, so uh, it was very well organized. Manfred was excellent. So anyway, that's where I lived first. And I lived there, I had the papers, the false papers, and I stayed there for about eight months. And then there was a holiday, with soon or something. And uh, my parents called and said, please come home, please come home. And I said to my friend, you know, I can't stand it. I gotta go home, I gotta see my parents. They were still in Amsterdam, nothing had happened to them. And so, um, Manfred said, don't do it. You never know what happens. I, do have, I have no information that anything's going to happen, but you never know. They might just all of a sudden decide on something, and you can't go, and you can't go. But I went. And, of course, I, I didn't wear a star at that time, right? It was an underground. They called that underground. You're listening to the story. 
Barbara Rodbell is one of the few German Jews who moved to Amsterdam and was still able to escape being shipped off to the concentration camps. There was that one time, though, when she went back to her old neighborhood to see her family. And uh, I went home. I went to a friend, put on a star, and then I went home. I couldn't get there without because of the neighbors. And uh, I went home. And, I, you know, we had this, this great hugging and kissing and taking care of each other and uh, and a good dinner and then somebody came and told us a woman that we we already called Cassandra she she came and she said you know this whole area is going to the Jewish people in this area are going to be picked up tomorrow morning she said, I just got the information from the underground, and this is what's going to happen. Goodbye, I've got to go see some other people. So, it, this was, I hadn't even slept overnight in that house, you know, in our place. And uh, now what to do? What to do? I mean, Manfred was right, of course, you know, you sh- I should have never done it. So then we started to to think what to do, and we decided that I would leave, even though. But now, at six, we had the whole night to talk, and they had to get ready, you know, to prepare themselves. Now, now you had papers, so you could I had leave, papers. No, they had papers, too. I mean, Manfred got papers for all of us. So they could have gone they underground? They could have, yes. They could have gone underground, but my father couldn't. My mother got the papers for Manfred. So I couldn't or wouldn't? He wouldn't. Why? Did he did he explain it? Yes, he did explain it. That's a good question. He said, I have been a lawyer all my life. I've never done anything against the law. And uh, I cannot live uh, under anything. You know, I can't do that. It's completely against my nature if the law says... And I, I yelled at him. I said, the law? What law? You know, he said, these are not your friends in at the university in Berlin. You know, these are criminals, you know. And, and of course, I was indoctrinated by Manfred, you know, who, who really ex- had explained the situation to me by that time. I was completely uh, non-political. I had no idea about anything. But he explained it to me. And, and he said, these are criminals. These are not... This, this is not le- legality in any way. You know. Did you have a chance to talk to your sister Susanna and say? Come yeah, I did. I mean, but uh, no, we did that. But we stood together. All you know, together. We, that yeah, we didn't. We, I wasn't separate. Uh, I couldn't talk to her alone, and she was fourteen. I mean, she was young. She might even have been. No, she was fourteen. She was fourteen, and we had this good place, anyway, in the house, and. Um, Again, this was a big pickup with a lot of people, and it was in my head. What if you don't open the door, you know? What if you don't open the door? I mean, what are they going to do? They, they have all these people to get, you know. The, okay, this is what happened. I did go. I said goodbye, and my father told me, go ahead, you by na- go. And uh, that was a blessing, because that was the last time I ever saw him. And so he said, go, go. So I had in my little carry-all, I had a sandwich, I had a bathing suit, a towel, and a comb or something. That was all I had. I had no money. I had maybe, you know, a gilden or something. But... um. I did ask my father, and my mother said to me, you know, Uncle Johan, who was married to a non-Jewish person, uh, he has some money and, and for you, you know, for, if, you, if you survive. I mean, I didn't know if I was going to be picked up. And I went down the stairs, and I, I tried not to think what I was doing. I was just going. And I was going down the stairs. It was quite a bit of stairs. And... Uh, then I was in, on the street, and there were loudspeakers, cars with loudspeakers going down the streets, and it was, it was saying, uh, Gentiles are not allowed on the street. All Jews have to prepare themselves. 
and I was on the street. Trying to pass as a Gentile with the, the false Gentiles papers, were not right? allowed on the street. Right, so you weren't meant to be there. Nobody was allowed to be there. No, yes, you're right. I was not allowed to be there. So, but I was going to go. I was just, I, I tried to stay near to the houses, but I had to cross the street because I had to, in Amsterdam, have you been in Amsterdam? Yes. You know, it has a bunch of rivers canals and, and canals and bridges. Yeah. And you had to get across a bridge. I had to get across a bridge to go to Manfred, you know. So uh, I had to cross, I had to go across the street, and I did. And the danger was that somebody saw you and said, you know, said, gave you away to, to the police or something. To, and uh, I came to the first bridge. And they were just staring at me. I mean, I was, I was very small, as I am now. And I had blonde pigtails. And I had this paper that said I was 27 years old. <laughs> and uh, they were saying to me, I had a little raincoat. It was warm. It was June 20th, 1943. 1943 exactly. And uh, on that bridge... There were three three people, as I remember it. Um, there was a, a, a green a policeman, a black no, there was a black Dutch policeman, then then a German, and then a, um, a one of the fascists, the green police we used to call them, people who gave away thing, you know, who the worst, the Nazis, the Dutch Nazis. And the collaborators. The collaborators. So there were three lovely guys up there. And I came, and they said, what are you doing? What are you doing here? And, and I said, well, I, was, uh, I came here to go to the swimming pool with my girlfriend, and, and uh, now there's all this stuff going on, you know, the loudspeakers, and my mother is going to be worried, and I have to go see my mother, and I'm afraid. And they said, get the hell, uh, so-and-so out of here. And, and uh, they didn't just believe you. They nobody you is allowed to go anywhere. And then uh, I, I had to leave, and I was very, very afraid because... Okay, there was another bridge not too far away, and I was running, but I was going along the side of the houses, you know, to that next bridge, and then again I had to cross from that protective wall of houses to that bridge, and I got to that bridge. On that bridge were two people, and they uh, it, it, they said, uh, what are you doing, you know, etc. And now I, I knew already that I couldn't have uh, come into this area. You had to change your story. I had to change the story. And so I said, well, I slept overnight with my girlfriend, and we were going to go swimming, and then I hear all this noise, and I know my wor my mother's going to be terribly worried, and, and, and I, my parents, I mean, I have to go see my parents, you know, the, and and they said, no, you better go back to your uh, girlfriend, and, and what do you do tonight, but we're not going to go, you cannot go across this bridge. And then I was crying. I mean, I left. And I was crying because that next bridge, that was quite a ways. And, and I had to go through a lot of country to get there, you know. And you're all by yourself. I was all. And, and so I, I ran carefully <laughs> down. Uh, nothing. Nobody was on the street. So I just went to that next bridge. I got to that next bridge, and there was a German, just one German soldier. He was very young. I would say by now, then I didn't think about it, but he was young. He could have been my brother, you know, something like that. And he saw me looking the way I was, tears, you know. And he spoke in German. He said, was this Lois? Was Master here? Uh, and of course, I said, I said in German, uh, I, I answered in German, I said, I, I want to go see my mother. I didn't even explain anything, you know. He said, I want to see my mother. And he says, where is, the, where is your mother? Where is Sandy Muti? You know, where is your mother? And I said, da. I just pointed. And he says, march. Schnell. Mach. Go. Los. Yeah. 
he let you through? Mash. Lost me, let me dear. Yeah. I mean, he he must have thought of his sister, you know, or something. I mean, and he was this crying girl, and, and I mean, what the heck, you know. And he was alone. He could make a decision. Those others, you know, had somebody else there who could have said, you know. But but he did that. He said, he said, Lois, Lois, ghost. He saved your life? Yeah, he saved my life. Barbara Rod Bell says she has prayed for that soldier since. She imagines him as an old man at home. Barbara made it back to Manfred's house, and late that night, Manfred and some others in the resistance went to Barbara's family home, but no one was there. She thought it was possible that her parents and sister had gone to a labor camp and survived, and that she'd see them after the war. She knows now they almost certainly died in Auschwitz in 1943. She spent the rest of the war with Manfred and his group of friends in the resistance. We'll hear more about how they survived in just a moment. I'm Dick Gordon from APM, American Public Media. This is the story. I'm Dick Gordon. This is the story. In 1944, Barbara Rod Bell was still in Amsterdam, living with a false name and papers. Those were difficult days. There was no food, no fuel. Everyone was cold and hungry. Barbara had a bit of jewelry she managed to sell for a small amount of money. When it got really, really bad around the, 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 the winter of uh, 44, 45, it was called the, the most terrible winter that they ever had. The, the American soldiers, you know, the infantry also suffered like crazy. Uh, uh, there was no food. And, and Amsterdam, the, the city of Amsterdam, I guess all the cities, had a soup kitchen that they ran and we ate out of the soup kitchen what was in the soup but I understand it was tulip bulbs soup and things but we had some old crackers that we ate with it some crackers that were as hard as a rock of course and uh, well you know there was no electricity really because there was no water the, 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 the electricity brought the water up to the third floor where we were living and there was no electricity so you had to go down you had certain hours that you could that it was your turn you know to go and get some water out of the 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 street waters and uh, you can imagine and there was no, were no coal we only had uh, a little stove you know that we that we that gave us some heat if we had something to put in there you know some kind of wood or people were breaking up furniture to, to oh yeah and and uh, what we did was uh, <laughs> we had something called peat which was uh, you you used to cut it out of not we did it's like, do a, it's it. like we a could, heavy moss like, almost like a soil yes yes it was out of a, uh, out, a bog out of a yeah out of some thing there and it came to the house and we thought oh how wonderful we, we had going to have some heat it burned very fast if it was dry really dry and we had this one little thing called a salamander stove and uh, it came and in it were bugs it turned out that there were fleas they were full of fleas and we had a flea plague and one night I remember I had 69 I killed 69 fleas I mean it was horrible it was just absolutely horrible and it didn't stop till the Americans came with DDT I mean you know and this was in the middle of the winter so how old were you Barbara when you moved to America 22 just it's un uh, it's inconceivable to me that you had lived all those different lives before your 22nd birthday. I find that unbelievable. Well, no, before it was over, I was only 20 or 21. I know, but still. You know, I, mean, you, you, I didn't come to the States till a few years after the war, not till 47. No. This winter, uh, Veterans Day of 47, I came to the United States. So by that, I, uh, but... I had had, so I was actually 20 when it was over, just 20. But it just, you seem to have lived so much of. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'd be exhausted. Really. 
Uh, my big man friend, he saved his mother, his sister, her husband, her, uh, I mean, uh, me, uh, you know, he just managed to do all that. I, I mean, he, well, I mean, we did it together. I really spent the war standing in line for food because we had to have food for all these people. And it wasn't just in one store, you know, those stores were still like a vegetable store and a milk store and, uh, you know, everything was separate. And, oh, you were hungry, you were cold. Sometimes you stand, stood in line for an hour and when you got there, there was nothing left. And I, it was amazing. I can't understand it myself. I mean, I was so thin, I, you could see, you could see through my navel, you could see my backbone. <laughs> it it was amazing. Yeah. I when I had my first child, my my gums just it grew and grew more, you know. Because you've been through this period of starvation. Yes, right? I had. I wasn't really ready to hadn't nurtured and had enough food. <laughs> Not enough years had gone by for me to really be. But with B twelve and etc. Whatever it was, they gave me. I managed. And 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 when you talk about the time of of the war, and you talk to teenagers to give them a sense of of what you learned, what do you tell them, Barbara? It's a wonderful question. I'm so glad you asked because that's my job. Uh, I I I look at the girls mostly because girls they have a little harder time making decisions. At least most girls. I know there are other girls, but most girls. So I say to them that you have to do what is good for you. Uh, while it doesn't hurt other people, you cannot do things because you want them to do if it's really going to hurt somebody. But I knew, I knew from Manfred, I must say, that... I could not help my parents. I could, one person under those circumstances that that we were in, that I was in, I did not hurt my parents by not going. You know, my my father kept saying, but they know that we have two children, two daughters, and if you are not here, we're going to be put in a special uh, barrack, which says Strafe, which is punishment. Uh, but Manfred had told me, don't fall for anything like that. Under live and die conditions, you cannot help another person. I mean, if you're, li if you're lined up to be shot and you get down first and don't get killed, you know, you're not helping anybody by standing up. That's what I was thinking of. That's what I was thinking of when I'm talking to these girls. I, I keep saying, think for yourselves. Think for yourselves. That's what's important. You know, what is good for you? If you, if you are in a difficult situation and you know that by leaving, you do not hurt the others, but you're helping yourself, you do it. You only have your one life. And, and you have to do, you mustn't hurt them. And maybe by doing what is good for you at that moment, you're actually helping them, or you can help them later. You don't know. You don't know what life's going to throw at you, what, what, what it's going to tell you. But I have to confess that I wasn't thinking all those wonderful thoughts. Nobody had, well, Manfred told me that. He did. And and uh, that's. You're saying you weren't thinking those thoughts. You weren't thinking. I wasn't thinking that I was hurting them. No, because in just in such a large pickup, and, uh, which this was, you know what they did was they at the time they were pe being picked up, the loudspeakers were going. This is what people told me because I didn't hear that. I was gone. <laughs> Uh, they told me that the loudspeaker said, all Jews come down the stairs. And if they did, all of them did. So, uh, you know, not everybody where I lived was Jewish, so they did not. Doors, some doors were not opened and people did not come out. And some Jews did not go. And if, if they, if my sister had just had to, 
guts, you know. But she thought, I'm sure that she thought she would be able to help or something. Or that she was doing the right thing. And she was doing the right thing. She, yeah. For her, she was, she was going with her parents. She was just too young, just a bit too young. Just think what Anne could have done. I'm in a writer like her. What she would have written when she was mature, truly mature. When was it, Barbara, that you realized that this young girl, this Anne Frank, who had simply been a kind of younger, I was going to say playmate, but a younger girl that you knew, had written this amazing diary and had become so famous? Was it years later when you realized? Mr. Frank actually came to see me. And he found me, you know, we found each other somehow. I didn't go to see him. So he, he came back to see me. I had heard he was back, but I hadn't seen him. And uh, he told me that they had found a diary of Anne's. This was before they made it into a book. I mean, you know, that took a while. It Did wasn't he know right away. what she'd written at that time? No, I don't, I want, I don't know if he, he had read some of it. I imagine he did. I mean, I would have, you know, if I would have. Sure. It was Miss Heaps, 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 who found that, and, uh, you know, and who gave it to Frank when he came back to Otto and Ed. Yeah, and... Uh, I actually did see Otto in, in Switzerland later. and I, So what was it like for you the very first time that you read the diary of Anne Frank? Do you recall? Yeah, I do. <laughs> I have the first edition, the first thing, you know, the first time came out, because he sent it to me. So it was, it, I couldn't believe it, actually, although she was... She was this bright, and she was... Uh, I couldn't believe her sitting down and, and really doing something from A to Z. You know, that was what I was surprised about. But she was certainly... And I kept saying to myself, she's grown up, she's grown up. She, she did grow up, you know, just like I grew up. I mean, we, it, yeah. I would have thought my sister, for instance, she could have done something, something like something that. Different. She was so wonderful. But, oh, my God, I would have expected it. But that she actually did it. I was surprised. But I then, thinking about it and thinking about what I've told you before, that she was so sparkly and full of ideas, and, 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 and I thought if she grew up, maybe she... That was really very possible that she... Well, I had it in my hand, so I th knew it was had happened. Yeah. So, and of course, it, 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 when I saw him, you know, I mean, this feeling that um, he had first of all that I was alive, and his daughters were dead, you know, and I th I saw him, and I thought it could have been my father. Why wasn't it my father? You know. Barbara stayed in touch with Otto Frank until his death years later. One thing she didn't mention was that, as a dancer in Amsterdam during the war years, she was able to stay out after curfew, and she used the privilege for her work with the resistance. After the war, she was among the survivors who went to the train station in Amsterdam. She held out hope that her parents or her little sister Susanna might have survived. In 1947, she emigrated to America. She was unable to support herself with her dancing, and she took a job with Ringling Brothers Circus. She later met and married the noted biochemist Martin Rod Bell. He would go on to win a Nobel Prize in 1994. Barbara and Martin had four children, as she says, two for her, two for her sister. <laughs> 